Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is our great pleasure to have Professor Bruce Bernd as our next speaker in this special functions and number theory seminar. So uh, he doesn't need any introduction. However, I'll just give, I'll tell in few lines about him. So he's one of the world's foremost authorities on Ramanujan's work. And he has devoted uh, many, many years expounding the work of Ramanujan. And he has written many books on Ramanujan's notebooks, as well as on Ramanujan's lost notebook, the latter being joint work with George Andrews. And he is uh, an author of over 275 papers in mathematics. And he has got a number of awards. Uh, so I'll just mention a few of them. In 1996, he got the AMS Steel Prize, uh, again, for uh, his work on Ramanujan. And uh, after he uh, finished writing all five volumes on, uh, or maybe not all five volumes, at that time it was four volumes on, the fifth one came in 1998, if I'm not wrong. But uh, yeah, it was, of course, uh, uh, on the work of Ramanujan that he did, uh, that he was awarded the Steel Prize. And uh, he has got um, honorary doctorate from uh, Shastra University in Kumbhakonam as well. And today he will be talking on his joint work with Professor Zaharisku and Sun Kim, uh, the title of which is what you see on the screen. So without further ado, I'll uh, tell Professor Brent to enlighten us on this topic. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Atul, for the kind introduction. So let me just give you an outline of my lecture. I'll spend uh, less than a minute talking about elementary trigonometry. And then I'll discuss Derek Clay's divisor problem. So for some of you who have uh, heard me lecture in the last couple of years at uh, seminars in India, Zoom seminars, uh, the first part of my talk you will have heard before, but, but I give it mainly because it's uh, inspired the remainder of the talk, the topics that I'll discuss. So in particular, Derek Clay's divisor problem leads us to a double series identity from Ramanujan's lost notebook connected with the divisor problem. And then I'll discuss uh, finite sums of products of trig functions. And uh, we'll give some theorems and well, as well as a number of conjectures on the growth of these uh, trigonometric sums. So in other words, these are partial sums with the upper index, say, x tending to infinity. And as is common in analytic number theory, we want to know, you know the behavior of such sums as x tends to infinity. And then I want to briefly mention Fresnel integrals and some recent remarkable work of a graduate student here at uh, Illinois, Li Kun Shi. And then uh, talk about uh, explicit evaluations of trigonometric sums, which is actually motivated or generated by the work on Fresnel integrals. And um, in addition to uh, explicit evaluations, uh, we have some reciprocity theorems for trigonometric sums, you might say analogous to the reciprocity theorem for the Legendre symbol. Yeah. So when I was in high school, uh, calculus was not taught. The most advanced courses that I had were a course in solid geometry. And then in the spring of my senior year course in uh, tri trigonometry. And by far, the course in trigonometry was my, my favorite course. So this is art. It's been a, a love of mine in more appropriately, I guess, trigonometric series. But as many of you know, uh, Ramanujan, uh, at the age of 12, borrowed from an older student, Loney's plain trigonometry. So he started learning trigonometry about five years before I started learning about trigonometry. And uh, in his book, he, in this book of uh, Loney, Ramanujan first learned about infinite series, as you can see here from the uh, Maclaurin series for the exponential function. 
So he was about six years ahead of me as far as learning about uh, infinite series. I didn't learn about them until I got to college. On my journeys to India, uh, I was given on two different occasions, uh, part one and part two of uh, Loney's plane trigonometry. So I don't know if these are used in India or not, but I really like these books. Uh, they have loads of the very nice problems in them, and uh, I can understand how Ramanujan uh, would have loved uh, learning mathematics from them. So let me talk about uh, Dirichlet's divisor problem. So here is a picture of Dirichlet that I grabbed from the internet. So we'll let d of n denote the number of positive divisors of the positive integer n, and d of x is the summatory function. I put a prime on this to indicate that if x is an integer, then we only account one half d of x. The reason that um, we do this is that in analytic number theory or in the discussion of the Dirichlet divisor problem, this is the sum which naturally arises. So let me just provide a very elementary argument here. So d of x is you can, this is just really the definition for summing over all divisors of n. So we write n as a product dj. So we're summing over all pairs dj less than or equal to x. So now I sum on j first. So j clearly goes to x over d. Okay, and uh, that sum is trivially uh, the floor function or the greatest integer function, square brackets of x over d. I'll come back to this elementary fact. So we can interpret the Dirichlet divisor problem geometrically, so let me do that first. So as I did in the previous screen, we'll let n be dj. So we can associate each divisor, each product dj with a lattice point in the first quadrant under the hyperbola ab equals x. So d of x, and now I'm not using the prime, so I'll just sort of ignore that in my discussion. It's equal to the number of lattice points in the first quadrant under or on this hyperbola. So Dirichlet's divisor problem first is equivalent to the problem of estimating the number of lattice points under or on a certain hyperbola. So this is the way I think Dirichlet argued. So uh, he divided the region under the hyperbola AB equals X into three parts. So first of all, he indicated the number of lattice points in parts one and two, and then in parts one and three, of course, by symmetry, these numbers are the same. And then since we've taken the square in both of our countings, uh, we have to, so, um, subtract off the number of lattice points in the square radius of side square root x. Okay, so here is what we have here is then say the number of lattice points uh, in regions one and uh, three, one and two, and of course the same in regions one and three. And then we subtract off the number of lattice points in region one. So we combine these together and replace square brackets of x over d by x over d. And here we replace square brackets of square root of x by square root of x minus the fractional part of x, as I've indicated here. Okay, and then I just simplify this after expanding out. And now we use uh, a famous result, a well-known result on estimating a partial sum of a harmonic series. So gamma is Euler's constant. Okay, so just using that uh, familiar uh, asymptotic formula and simplifying, uh, we get uh, this approximation for d of x. Okay, so in other words, uh, we've shown that um, the summatory function uh, for d of n is equal to these main terms. Now you 
I've stuck in a quarter here, and you might say, well, you silly boy, why am I sticking a quarter here? This doesn't have anything to do with the order of magnitude of the error term. Uh, the reason it's there is that, in, as we'll see in analytic discussions of this problem, the one quarter uh, sort of naturally appears. So this is the error term. And so what uh, Derek Clay showed was that this is big O of square root of x as x tends to infinity. But clearly, this won't be the order of magnitude or the best order of magnitude for the error term. What is the proper order, the best order? This is Derek Clay's divisor problem, asking for the order of d of this error term, delta of x as x tends to infinity. So there is a representation for the error term in terms of an infinite series of Bessel functions. So this uh, will justify my talking in this seminar. So the I one is this linear combination of uh, Y and K. So K is a modified uh, Bessel function. And this is, I think, usually called Bessel function of imaginary argument. So what's important for us in this representation of the error term are these asymptotic formulas. So uh, we really don't have to worry about uh, k nu of x because uh, this goes to zero exponentially as x tends to infinity. So the main contribution will come from uh, y nu or y1. Yeah. So you see then if uh, from if we want to estimate the sum, uh, we have to estimate then a trigonometric sum and estimating this trig trigonometric sum then is sort of the main thing we have to do in order to get an improved error term. I'm being a little bit uh, simple, simple minded here uh, in this. There's a lot of work involved and there are equivalent rep ways of uh, looking at this error term or the sum. So um, this formula is actually called Voronoi's formula, and he used uh, this to prove that delta of x is big O of x to the one-third log x as x tends to infinity. And as far as I know, the best result is still due to Huxley, uh, as I've given here. Uh, this has been improved a little bit by Sondarajan. He's replaced the x to the epsilon by a power uh, of log x. The conjecture is that uh, d of x is big O of x to the one quarter plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero. So there is an identity involving d of n that's found in a one-page manuscript published with Ramanujan's Lost Notebook, page 335 to be precise. And here is this uh, one-page manuscript. And it is the second formula on this manuscript uh, that I want to uh, emphasize or discuss. So th this is it. Um, I've changed Ramanujan's notation a little bit on the left-hand side. So here we have uh, a double sum on the right-hand sides. These, the I1 is exactly the same as the I1 appearing in Voronoi's formula. So let me just say a few words about this sum to you know, hope provide a little inspiration or appreciation for this uh, identity of Ramanujan. If you take theta equals zero, then on the left-hand side, let me just go back, you can see that we just get uh, this elementary formula for d of x that uh, I derived just a few minutes ago. So uh, this is a generalization then of that uh, simple formula that we derive. Okay, let me again remind you of Voronoi's formula. So again, those Bessel functions are the same in Ramanujan's formula as they are in Voronoi's formula. Okay, so uh, it took us a long time to prove Ramanujan's result and um, so I rescue my colleague Alexander Zorescu, my former student son Kim and I first proved the result 
<clears throat> but we had to invert the order of summation and we had to make a rather unusual uh, assumption. We had to prove, we had to assume that the result is true for one value of theta. And then we also could prove the identity if we didn't think of this as a reiterated series, but as a sum where the product mn tends to infinity. Uh, so the three of us did this in 2013. The method that we used uh, to prove the result with the order of summation reversed did not work uh, with the order of summation as Ramanujan had written it. So here is a picture of Sun Kim. This is a picture of uh, Zhao Rescue. So the theorem that Ramanujan uh, claimed uh, was not proved until 2019 when Junxian Li uh, joined Zhao Rescue and myself to prove the identity as Ramanujan had it. So uh, we entitled our paper, The Final Problem and Identity from Ramanujan's Lost Notebook, because it was really uh, the last result that uh, was re remaining in the work that George Andrews and I were doing on proving all the results in Ramanujan's Lost Notebook. Yeah, I uh, use Ramanujan's Lost Notebook uh, in a broad sense here in that I'm talking about all the results in the uh, publication, the Ramanujan's Lost Notebook and other unpublished papers uh, that uh, was published in 1988 by the Tata Institute. And if you want to just uh, see a, a summary or a sketch of the ideas, um, these appear in a short, much shorter paper uh, in uh, a book dedicated to George Andrews uh, on his 80th birthday. So we think that uh, Ramanujan devised this or proved this result. Uh, thinking about Dirichlet's divisor problem, we have this extra parameter theta in here. And perhaps he thought that uh, this identity with the extra parameter theta might be helpful in uh, attacking Dirichlet's divisor problem. We knew from, <clears throat> excuse me, other work that Ramanujan had done that he was interested uh, in this problem. Let me say a few more words about our title. Uh, and this is Junxian Li, who is a PhD student of uh, Zhao Rescue. So G.N. Watson uh, wrote a paper and actually this arose from the address he gave to the London Mathematical Society on the final problem. So he called this uh, paper uh, the final problem because he gave an account of some of the work on mock theta functions from, from Ramanujan's last letter uh, to Hardy. And he took the title he sort of from a famous short story, The Adventure of the Final Problem, one of the Sherlock Holmes stories written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And uh, he probably was also motivated by the fact that in these 24 Sherlock Holmes story, Sherlock Holmes' famous uh, sidekick was Dr. Watson. So Watson did a lot of borrowing and then we continued borrowing uh, uh, from as uh, Watson did. Yeah. So now, <clears throat> having proved uh, Ramanujan's uh, formula, finally, we ask ourselves, are there any further identities uh, that we could obtain using the ideas that we developed to prove Ramanujan's formula? And we were able to do this. We were able to actually obtain uh, identities for trigonometric sums. And then we ask about taking derivatives. Because if we take derivatives of the theorems that we got, we could get further results. 
The identities for trigonometric sums actually involve two variables. So we can answer the third question by saying, yes, we can take derivatives if we take balanced derivatives. Now, what do we mean by a balanced derivative? Well, there are now two variables, and if we take the same number of derivatives for each variable, we can justify it. We cannot justify our work if we just take a different number of derivatives. So that remains open if that can be done. So in particular, we can take zero balance derivatives and um, then we can actually then justify that it doesn't make any difference in proving Ramanujan's formula, for example. If we prove it with one order of summation, it actually, we can actually prove it uh, with the other order of summation. In other words, we really now can prove both orders in the same way. Okay, and so this work appeared in a paper very recently that um, Zara Rescue Sun Kim and I wrote with um, Martino Fasina, who was a recent graduate student at the University of Illinois. Uh, here is a picture of Martino Fasina. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, Martino has left mathematics. Um, he returned to, in, to um, his home in Italy at the beginning of the COVID, and he could not get back into the United States to assume his postdoc position at Indiana University. So he did not have a, a job for uh, over a year. And so he went into another business. He actually works as a self-publisher now. So if you want, if you have a position where you really want a, an excellent mathematician whose main field is several complex variables, I, I recommend you contact Martino Fasina. So here is one of the sums of trigonometric functions that we examine. So note I have uh, two cosines here. Okay, and I'm putting a lot in this uh, uh, slide. So we can express this sum involving a product of two cosines in a series of Bessel functions, but now there are four quotients, as you see here, and there are now two variables, two summation variables and two continuous or analytic variables. So what I have done here is I've taken an even number of derivatives for each uh, uh, of the variables sigma and theta, and I brought the uh, uh, derivatives inside the summation. Okay, so that's the theorem that we proved. In other words, that we could actually interchange the order of summation. <clears throat> so <clears throat> then the uh, problem that one naturally asks is, you know, what about the behavior of the sum as x tends to infinity? And we were, show, we were able to show, analogous to what Voronoi did, that this double sum is big O of x to the one-third plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero, as x tends to infinity. And then we conjecture that the limb soup of the sum over x to the one-quarter is infinity and the limb imp is minus infinity. So in other words, the best order, the order of the sum is big O of x to the one quarter plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero. But we, we cannot prove this. So the, for the Dirichlet divisor problem, this is a theorem, but for our sums, we only can make a conjecture. So here is a double sign sum. So we can derive an identity for this from scratch, so to speak, using the ideas that we had for proving Ramanujan's theorem. Or as you can see here, we can get this uh, result from differentiating the previous result once 
uh, with respect to both uh, theta and sigma. Okay, so now we can actually show that this uh, sum is big O of x to the 17 over 12 plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero. Note we have a much bigger exponent because, well, uh, no, remember we have an M and N in our summations. So we would expect something that the order of magnitude would be, of course, larger. Uh, and we conjecture that uh, the sum is big O of X to the five quarters plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero. So again, this is a conjecture. We can't prove this. So we have a lot of evidence for this conjecture, but we can't prove it. So here, what we know and what we conjecture are a bit closer together than we have uh, for the Dirichlet divisor problem, uh, as you can see from these two simple decimal expansions then. Let me just give you one example, uh, a very special case, maybe to give you maybe a little geometric uh, appreciation. So I'll take theta and sigma both to be a quarter. So we have these signs appearing uh, in the identities. Okay, so uh, here I've just plugged in these signs. And uh, since M and N are now odd here, uh, then I just replace the M and N by 2J plus 1, 2K plus 1. Okay, so wh what are we doing here? We're counting lattice points under a hyperbola again, but we require both of the coordinates to be odd, and we've put a weight here. Uh, actually, maybe two weights you can think of it, or three, namely the lattice points themselves, and uh, then we have another weight uh, power of minus one. <clears throat> uh, so, I mean, you, if you wish, one can, you know, give geometric interpretations uh, for other values of theta and sigma. Now we can go further. We can examine the sum with a product of eight of k uh, signs uh, in the uh, sum here. And um, I won't give you any identity. It's, as you might expect, somewhat complicated. However, uh, we can uh, say something about uh, the order of magnitude of these sums. So in analogous, in analogy to what I just showed you for two variables, uh, we can make these conjectures on the order of magnitude of them. So here the power is x to the 3k minus 1 over 2k. Uh, so just compare this with the what we had for two, uh, a product of two signs. So in other words, when k is two, you see that uh, we get this conjecture that we previously mentioned. Okay, what about uh, big O estimates? Well, we can prove that this sum is big O of x to the 2k over k plus 1 plus epsilon as epsilon tends to zero. So if k is 2, we get our, our previous theorem. So let's look at the powers for two consecutive uh, k's. Okay, so here we replace k by k plus 1, and, and here is what we have uh, in the theorem. Okay, so this is the, the difference. So in other words, by increasing the number of signs by 1, in these sums, this increases the upper bound for the power in the error term by a small amount, big O of 1 over k squared. Now, I, em I emphasize this is not the correct order of magnitude, or we don't think it's the correct order of magnitude. I'm just sort of indicating that with increasing k, the bounds that we get, you know, increased a little bit, and that is big O of 1 over k squared, so to speak. So in other words, for obtaining good bounds, it becomes a little bit harder with increasing k. Okay, and here's the difference between what we have can prove and then what we can conjecture. So that difference then is tending 
is getting larger, so to speak. It's tending to a half as x tends to infinity. Okay, and this is a special case when k is equal to 2. <clears throat> now let me um, change topics a bit here, and st but I still will um, discuss trigonometric sums. There's a very interesting paper by Richard McIntosh uh, in 1996, which I've always enjoyed. Uh, Richard sent me a picture of himself. It's not a very good picture of himself, but uh, this is the best I think he could send me. So let me just give you the uh, elementary Fresnel integral. So the double parentheses function uh, is defined uh, x minus square brackets x minus a half if x is not an integer zero if x is an integer. And the Fresnel integral uh, is this integral here, and this is easy to evaluate. Uh, it's given here. Um, this is AB here is the greatest common divisor of A and B. So the Fresnel integral is actually connected uh, with Dedekind sums. So this is the uh, or definition of the ordinary Dedekind sum, S of P, Q. And as many of you know, this satisfies a, a reciprocity theorem as I've given here. And if you... Um, read about, uh, about proofs of this, I, uh, or want proofs of this, I highly recommend this um, monograph by Hans Rademacher and Emo Grosswald on Dedekind sums. And in particular, on page 30, 25, uh, the authors give a proof um, of the reciprocity theorem, uh, which uses Fresnel, Fresnel's integral. I think they give maybe three or four different proofs altogether, but one of them involves Fresnel's integral. Yeah. So here is a picture of Fresnel that uh, I uh, got from the internet. And Wikipedia said a little bit about uh, Fresnel, so let me just quote what George Polia said. He said that he was an especially attractive kind of person and a very good teacher. But that, since he spent most of his time teaching and reading French literature, for which he had a passion, he had no time for research. After his retirement, he worked on the Riemann hypothesis. So as, as far as I know, he didn't prove the Riemann hypothesis. Well, um, Richard McIntosh, uh, you know, said, um, it's natural that we might examine a Fresnel integral with four of these double parentheses functions in the integral. So we ask, well, can this be evaluated or can you say something about this integral? So he evaluated a, a couple special cases. And then he made this um, remarkable conjecture here he said numerical calculations suggest that this function f of a, b, c, e, by the way, I've used e here instead of d just because of the integration variable dx. So he says that this rather complicated expression times this integral is inter integer valued, but he says a proof is out of reach. So these are all greatest common divisors, as you can see in this uh, rather long formula. So it's really a remarkable conjecture. I, uh, he really had a lot of insight uh, in order to make this conjecture. And I had thought about it on and off. I had no ideas how to prove this. Yeah. Well, we suggested this uh, to a graduate student at Illinois, Lee Kun Shi. And I told Zaharescu, there's no way she's able to go prove this. This is too difficult of a theorem to prove or conjecture to prove. And within a couple of weeks, she actually proved it. So we said, well, let's see if we can, uh, if she can do anything 
with an arbitrary product of an even number of double parentheses functions uh, in the integrand. And again, we thought this is going to be way too difficult for proof for four of these functions in the integrand that this Macintosh's conjecture was very difficult. But within a couple of weeks, she found a proof of this. Uh, she uh, was able to formulate a conjecture and prove it. By the way, if n is odd, the, uh, the value of the integral is zero by just symmetry arguments. Well, this is a bit hard to digest, but this is her theorem. So again, n is even, b is the denominator of the Bernoulli polynomial pn plus 1. Okay, and um, then this is the what's multiplying the integral. So this is the, again, the 2k, i2k, the integral which I previously showed you. And these are products of greatest common divisors. So note for a particular m, we're taking the greatest common divisor of over all these possibilities um, and with the only stipulation that they be increasing in index then. So it's a remarkable theorem, uh, very complicated, and the proof is very difficult. So uh, if k is equal to 1, the theorem says that this integral is original Fresnel integral uh, is an integer. And when k is equal to 2, the theorem reduces to Macintosh's conjecture. So then Zarescu and I were discussing this, and we said, well, the double parentheses function is really the first Bernoulli function. And uh, what about replacing the first Bernoulli function by a general uh, Bernoulli function? Okay, so how about looking at this integral, uh, where k is an odd positive integer, and I have this wave, this tilde over to indicate that this is the argument uh, uh, in general would be x minus square brackets x in the definition of Bernoulli function. Well, uh, she was able to prove a theorem for this uh, integral as well. Uh, and it's, as you might expect, rather complicated to state, so I actually won't state it. So uh, my name and Zarescu's name are on this paper, which was recently accepted for publication. Uh, we might, you know, we made minor contributions to this integral. All the credit really should go to, to Leakin for her work. Yeah. So... It's really marvelous work that uh, she has done. Well, in Macintosh's paper, uh, there's some further work which uh, motivated us. So I defined the Dedekind sum uh, a few minutes ago. This is another Dedekind sum. Uh, and I, I see I'm missing a, uh, sorry, no, this is the way Macintosh uh, mentioned it or defined it. And this is the third Bernoulli function. So let me remind you that the Bernoulli polynomials are uh, generated as I've indicated here. So in this uh, paper of Macintosh, he examines uh, the sum with two uh, trigonometric functions with two independent periods, A and B. So there are many, many theorems in the literature uh, evaluating trigonometric sums, finite trigonometric sums, with one period. So there really isn't anything, as far as I know of, towards the evaluation of trigonometric sums with two periods. So <clears throat> Macintosh expressed this sum in terms of a sum of, of uh, these Bernoulli functions. So he didn't really have a, an evaluation uh, as we would want, because it's really in terms of some further sums. So, but, but that um, you know, inspired us to you know, examine the problem. You know, can we find 
uh, or can we evaluate trigonometric sums with two linearly independent periods? So uh, well, we, we did have some success in, in this uh, direction, and we evaluated some other uh, trigonometric sums as well. So let me uh, first, <clears throat> sorry, I'm having a frog in my throat here. So let me tell you about some of the theorems that we proved um, tending, so to speak, in the direction of, of Macintosh's sum. So we have a general theorem for evaluating uh, finite sums of quotients of cosines here. And let me just indicate a, a special case. This is when k is equal to 7. I've rearranged the theorem a little bit. So our evaluation reduces to this identity, that this sum is equal to 41. Well, it turns out that this uh, example was also established by, and I'm sorry I don't pronounce his, I can't pronounce his name correctly, I'm sure, Urs Rebeck, Rebeck. So he uh, evaluated this sum in solving a long-standing open problem in Ramanujan's Lost Notebook. So let me just briefly describe uh, this problem. Uh, Ramanujan gives a formula for evaluating a certain theta function, but he has three terms in the formula, but he doesn't give what the terms are. So when I examined this formula in my work with George Andrews, I sort of ignored it. I said, well, he obviously doesn't have a theorem. You know, he's got, you know, blanks there. He just drew a horizontal line in each case, indicating that there are three terms here. So I just assumed that Ramanujan didn't know how to fill it in. He just conjectured there was some result of this type. Well, uh, Reback actually proved, filled it in and, and completed Ramanujan's uh, identity, and this will appear shortly in the Ramanujan journal. It's a, a very difficult proof and really an excellent piece of work. Yeah. So we also have, uh, we're able to evaluate uh, sums of this type. And let me just give you a special case. Uh, I've replaced, I've looked at odd integers here. So this is the result uh, uh, in this case. So the A is two uh, in this case. So recall the definition of the kth triangular number, T of K is K, K plus one over two. And let's take T of T of K. So this is T of T of K and note that we get the same polynomial here. So in other words, if we combine uh, these two results, this one in the formula for t of t of k, we see that this sum is a simple multiple of t of t of k. So this is actually observed by Rebeck, and he did it at almost exactly the same time. It's just pure coincidence that when we evaluated this, I think what... Uh, uh, he wrote a letter to me and he said he's looking at trigonometric sums and uh, he had this argument here and like a day or two earlier I, uh, I had evaluated the sum so it's just a pure coincidence that we evaluated the sum at the same time but he had much more insight into the sum than I did and he had derived the representation in this way. So we might ask, you know, is this a special case of a more general result involving trying, you know, uh, iterated triangular numbers? And uh, uh, this, I don't know. So in other words, if, uh, if you're interested in this, please do something, try to, uh, if you find something, uh, please tell us. So uh, here is a picture of Rebecca. So this was actually taken in Austria 
Um, he's actually Hungarian, and he's a graduate student in mathematics at the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø. So now let me get back uh, to uh, Macintosh's result. So um, this is uh, after translating his result and doing some work. Uh, this is a theorem that actually was proved by uh, Macintosh. <clears throat> this is not; these sums are not don't involve two linearly independent work periods, but we were able to actually to prove this result uh, using some other things that Macintosh did in terms of these uh, Bernoulli functions, S3. Yeah. So this is a reciprocity theorem. Uh, in other words, you can see that in getting from one sum to the next sum, we've just interchanged the P and Q. So again, this isn't in Macintosh's work, but we can derive it from things that Macintosh proved. So we can actually generalize our argument, and we can actually prove a reciprocity theorem now for uh, not only the second power down here in the sign, but any uh, even uh, power, uh, positive power. So let me just give you the result for the fourth power. Uh, so as you can see, it gets more complicated uh, uh, in the polynomial P and Q on the right-hand side. But even though it's complicated, we think it's a, a beautiful reciprocity theorem. So now we might ask, well, can we look at sums where instead of two cotangents in the numerator, we have four cotangents in the numerator? And we're able to prove, you might say, a four, four sum reciprocity theorem. So just to give you somewhat of appreciation for these sums, we're seeing the symmetry here. So here is the summation index going to Q minus one. So here are the other three variables, P, R, and uh, S. So here we don't have them, uh, either any of the variables. So you can see then the symmetry involved in these four sums. Yeah. Okay, so the sum of those four sums is equal to this. Yeah. A bit complicated, but that's the way the, the theorem is. And we can actually generalize this to any even number of sums. So uh, in the previous results, we had sines in the denominator. So we can also prove results for cosines. I'm just giving an easier one here involving cosine squared. So again, we have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a reciprocity theorem for these sums. Here's another theorem we proved. So uh, if you have, uh, so this is an uh, even, non-principal character modulo P. Uh, and uh, A is a positive uh, odd integer. So if we had a Gauss sum, we would have the same kind of sum here, but without the sign in the denominator. So in other words, we ask, well, suppose we take a Gauss sum, or it's really just part of a Gauss sum because we took one sign uh, in Gauss sum, you would have an exponential here. And we just put an extra sign here. So we are able to get a, a formula for this. Uh, so this is a Gauss sum here. So this looks complicated, but um, for small values of A, it, it's not too complicated. I'll just give an example. Suppose you take A equals 5. So in that sum on the right-hand side, there are three terms. And uh, we have a condition on those terms in the sum. So this is what it reduces to. And uh, these are the values of the parameters. So here is the value of the sum from our formula. <clears throat> so we get square root of P if P is congruent to 1 or 7 mod 8 and minus square root P if P is congruent to 3 or 5 mod 8. 
So for those of you who are, know about the values of Gauss sums, uh, these kinds of values are very familiar. So now let me get to uh, one of the sums that was motivated by Macintosh's theorem. Uh, so here, uh, the general theorem we have is <clears throat> somewhat complicated, so I'm just giving uh, some, a special case of the theorem. So I'm assuming that Q is congruent to plus or minus one mod P here. Okay, so here we have an exact evaluation with the sum of two um, independent periods, P and Q, and two different evaluations depending upon the residue class here of Q uh, modulo P. Yeah. So we have a much more general theorem, but um, it's a bit too complicated to give in a lecture. We actually have two different approaches for these sums. One involves contour integration, and the other one involves working with roots of unity. So in the literature on trigonometric sums, contour integration and working with roots of unity are techniques that have been used many times. However, in our work on contour integration, we have actually extended the methods uh, using contour integration, and we've extended the ideas using roots of unity. Yeah. So uh, I gave you a theorem involving sines in the denominator. Um, here involved, we have cosines in the denominator, and uh, we have a similar result. It's actually a little bit easier in this case. So again, I'm assuming in this result that uh, Q is congruent to either one or minus one modulo P. Yeah. Again, we have a more general result uh, involving cosines in the denominator. And we have these ideas can give us results uh, involving just roots of unity as well. So here is a reciprocity theorem where everything is expressed just in terms of roots of unity. So uh, this these are p-thruts of unity and then q-thruts of unity. Yeah. So I think those are all the examples I'll give. Um, uh, the original idea involving uh, contour integration uh, was, uh, came in a paper I wrote with Cell Rescue back in 2004. And we've extended the results even further in this paper that we recently wrote with uh, Sun Kim, uh, which we've uh, submitted for publication. But uh, if any of you are the referees of this paper, I, I hope that you're sufficiently uh, motivated to accept our paper for publication if you're a referee. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak on this special occasion in your special seminar and special functions. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Pernin. Uh, are there any questions for him? Okay, so I had a couple of questions. So one, one was regarding this work of Bettin and Conray, where they have a certain kind of cotangent sum, which is connected with the zeta zeros. The, and it also has a reciprocity result. Oh. That's, yeah, I forgot. We did know of that result. Yeah, I, I can't remember that. I can't quote it for you, but that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So there it was some m by k times cotangent pi m by k and sum over k. Uh, here it is cot, cot and cosecant square. Oh. Mm. Okay. So uh, yeah. Th hey, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so maybe uh, it could be seen, uh, it could be um, useful to see if the sums that you encounter also have any connection with the zeta zeros. Oh, uh, uh, that would be great. Uh, yeah, please investigate that. I, <laughs> I would be pleased if that happened. Okay. And there was another question that I had. Um, 
I mean, maybe this is completely wild, but uh, uh, like you had balanced derivatives, mm -hmm. there be some sort of sensible thing to do balanced integrals. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> maybe with respect to theta. <laughs> yeah, so in other words, uh, integrals involving two uh, non-parameters besides the variable of integration. Uh, right. Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> okay. Um, so these sums are all involve Bessel functions on the right hand side. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you know maybe if you had some integrals involving Bessel functions and there were two parameters, but I, I don't know of any examples offhand. But um, okay. yeah, no, it would be very nice to see such a theorem. <laughs> no. I I can't envision any how it would look. Yeah, such a theorem would look. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, any other questions? A wonderful talk. I put a question in the chat regarding independent periods. Oh, yeah. So, the, if I um, understand your correction, yeah, so in other words, <clears throat> so if I have, um, so I had P in the denominators of some of the trig functions and Q in the denominators of the other ones, so the periods are either P or 2P or Q and 2Q. Um, so we assume, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm uh, from, we're assuming that P and Q have no connections with each other. So in other words, that's what I mean by independent periods. One doesn't depend upon the other. They're, they're completely free uh, parameters, you know, positive integer parameters. Did, did I answer your question? Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, I request everybody to unmute themselves and clap for the beautiful talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, everyone. You're very welcome.